Hi everyone, good morning. Thank you for joining us here at Natural Womanhood for our very first uh, live round table discussion. Um, thanks for uh, some of you getting up early maybe to watch this with us. Um, we have a really exciting discussion for everyone today. We're going to be discussing, as the title of the uh, event suggests, a study that found no adverse outcomes associated with the use of hormonal contraception. Now this was a study that was published recently in a scientific medical journal called JAMA Network Open, which is a monthly open access journal published by the American Medical Association. So this isn't some obscure journal. This is something that comes from the American Medical Association. Um, and they took a look at 58 different meta-analyses, so big studies, uh, concerning hormonal contraceptive use and found after looking through all of those studies that there were no adverse health outcomes for women who used hormonal contraception. We took a look at that conclusion and thought there might be something a little bit fishy there and we did a deep dive into the study to figure out how they reached that conclusion which those of you who've been following along with us in our FDA petition over the last few months know we have found quite a few evidence-based adverse outcomes associated with the use of hormonal contraception. So taking a deep dive into this new uh, study public, published in JANA, JAMA Network Open, we found some interesting uses of some of the same data that we've used in our own FDA petition. Um, and we're here to talk with Dr. Bill Williams, Dr. Joel Brand, and Dr. Kathleen Raviel about this study, how they achieve this outcome and what it says about uh, what we can trust about hormonal contraception for women. Um, so as I said, joining us today is Dr. Williams. He is the lead author of our citizen's petition to the FDA. Uh, he's also the editor emeritus of the Lineker Quarterly. And we also have Dr. Joel Brend with us today. Professor Emeritus of Human Biology and Endocrinology at Baruch College of the City University of New York, and Dr. Kathleen Raviel, who is a retired board-certified obstetrician gynecologist who had a private practice in the Atlanta area for 33 years. So thank you all for joining us this morning um, mm -hmm. to talk about this important study, uh, which has implications for women and girls everywhere. I think it's important that we highlight that these studies have implications for policy making, for what doctors will discuss with their patients in their offices. So this has real world impact, this study. Um, and that's why it's important that we keep our eyes on it and we discuss what is happening in, in, in the scientific world. Um, so first, to kick off our conversation, I'm going to ask Dr. Brind to discuss the, the JAMA uh, umbrella review, as they, the researchers have called it, um, and give us an idea of how they reached the conclusion that they did. So Dr. Brind, if you'd get started with us there, please. Oh, sure. Well, I think my guess is that they reached the conclusion that they did before they even started to write the paper. Uh, you can see things, as you say, very fishy about it right from the top line. The title, it says, Association of Hormonal Contraceptive Use with Adverse Health Outcomes, an Umbrella Review of Meta-Analyses of Randomized Controlled co Trials and, co and Cohort Studies. The, uh, that gives you the impression that whatever they found, they found about hormonal contraception, which of course includes a combination oral contraceptive pills and progestin-only pills mm -hmm. and progestin-only implants like levonorgestrel and uh, Depo-Provera. Uh, oh yes, it's all safe, 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 safe. And then you, you read in their conclusions at the very end of the paper, I mean the, the penultimate sentence of the entire paper, quote, when drawing conclusions about clinical practice from the findings of this umbrella review, it is necessary to be mindful that progestin-only methods, i.e. progesterone-only tablets, depo medrosic, depo uh, DMPA injections, progesterone implants, and levonorgestrel-releasing intrauterine systems are not represented 
in a clinically, clinically meaningful way. So right away you know that the title is misleading. The title should have said, talked about the risk of combination oral contraceptives, estrogen, progestin containing oral contraceptive pills, because those are the only ones that they say themselves have, have given them any clinically meaningful data. So right away there's a problem. Well, that's the title. So gee, <laughs> if, if the title is so bad and so misleading, what could be worse? Let's skip down to the, oh no, wait a minute. Let's not skip down. Let's look at the byline. Who wrote the paper? Well, there's a whole bunch of this. I don't know, there's seven or eight people there, a whole bunch of MDs and PhDs. But wait, the first author has a bachelor's degree in pharmacy. Gee, that's authoritative. But they get it into the JAMA, you know, Journal of the American Medical Association, and that's, and that can move, move mountains in terms of uh, medical practice. So right away we have some serious problems. But the the worst of it is when you get to the meat of it, and you look at the data that they do have, you say, okay, well, at least it's it's good it's good clinical data for, um, for a combination of oral contraceptives, right? Uh, not exactly. What they've done is, um, they've done here what, what's called an umbrella study. Now an umbrella study, oh yes, it's bigger and better and all of this. It's not, there's a study, and a study is where you look at women, the, the you know, whether you do uh, clinical outcomes, blood tests, whatever, you look at, you look at the women, the subjects, and you do your statistical analysis and your observations. Then there is something called a meta-analysis where you look at maybe five, 10, 15 studies, 20 studies, and you put them all together and you, you therefore can increase the statistical power by taking, uh, by having a larger N, a larger sample size so that your conclusions are more, uh, more reliable. Right. But then you take this kind of study, you take all the meta-analyses and you do a meta-analysis of meta-analyses, an umbrella study. Well, what's interesting is the criteria they use to arrive at their conclusions, which shows you that they're, what they're trying to do, unlike what the methodology of epidemiology is supposed to do, to increase the sensitivity, get rid of the noise, increase the sensitivity so that our observations are more precise, more reliable, more robust. No, what they did here is they move the goalpost, as you might say, in a football analogy, so that um, you cannot uh, find any, you, you define down what a statistical result means. Uh, the way I would, I might, would describe it as a, as a scientist is you have a microscope and you have, your microscope can be focused on low power, medium power, high power, where you have much more uh, sharper view, much more sensitivity, you zoom in. And what they're doing here is they're zooming out. So let's say you see in a microscope, oh, it looks like there's a little uh, collection of uh, bacteria here that don't belong there, but I'm not quite sure. We're at the limits of our, of our uh, perception and detection. Uh, so let's go to a lower power. Oh, look, nothing here. Well, that's exactly what they did. And you can see from one of their first uh, tables where they describe their methodology. Now, instead of having a study that's either significant or not significant, and when you put them together into a meta-analysis, you can really see if these things are significant. They have redefined their terms. So now they have what they call five categories of quality of data. The first category, the best, is convincing. The next is highly suggestive, that's class two. Class three, they say, suggestive. Then there's class four, which they call weak, and then there is non-significant. Well, non-significant, we all know, is that if we're not at least 95% sure that the result is not a random finding, a chance finding, we say it's significant. <clears throat> well, if it achieves that level of being significant, which is what we all look for in a study and then in a meta-analysis, if you do a meta-analysis and you find that there is still a significant result, more than 95% certain that it's real, that it's at least not due to chance. Right. That's certainly significant, especially remember we're dealing with a medical 
uh, intervention, a drug which is prescribed for healthy people. <laughs> this is right. totally elective. Right. So the standard right. should certainly be higher in the do no harm category, getting Hippocratic mm -hmm. here. Well, so what they've done is now, <clears throat> they've said that if it's, if the, if the p-value is less than 0.05, that 95% certainty, uh, if it achieves that, we won't call it significant, we'll call it weak. And then in order to be, well, what about slightly better than weak? What about making it suggestive? You know, we can call this an A, B, C, D, F kind of scale, right? So we're, we're going, you know, an F is not significant. A, 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 a significant finding, now we're calling weak. We're giving it a D. Well, what's a C? Uh, class three, suggestive. What do you need? Well, for that, you need at least a thousand participants, arbitrary number. You know, the statistical models tell you whether the right. N is good enough or not. If you have the statistical power, you don't just throw in an ar arbitrary, oh, it's got to have at least a thousand. So they basically took an established precedent of 95% being right. um, kind of arbitrarily no longer good enough. Right. Is that right. correct? And Yes, it's no longer good enough. And in fact, now remember, we're still C grade, you know, suggestive. So that for that, you need a p value of 10 to the minus 3. That means 95% isn't good enough. You need 99.9 .9 to be called suggestive. Mm. This, is, this is already, you know, totally off the rails. But we still have, we still have highly suggestive. For highly suggestive, P less than 10 to the minus 6. We don't need 95%. We don't need 99%. We need 99.9999% certainly. Mm -hmm. this and is again, the, that's to be sure that the, the results that you've gotten in your study are not due to chance, correct? Right, yes. It, it, there are all, all kinds of pitfalls in epidemiology, and there are valid statistical methods to weed them out. But what they're doing here is they're misusing, they're cherry-picking data taking data they like and not what they don't like and they're using it to and they're to just, zooming uh, out as yes, you said rather this. than zooming in right and then what about convincing you know uh convincing is even even more um you know it has a whole bunch of statistical tests which make it even more rigorous to be called convincing so there are lots of convincing studies there are lots of convincing meta-analyses including the one that we did on uh, dmpa uh, which is Defo Provera for Defo Provera, everyone listening. Right, right. And, uh, and they show, you know, at the P less than 0.05, and it's less than probably 0.01 or 0.02 in most cases anyway. It's probably somewhere between 95 and 99 percent, but 99 is not good enough. 99.9 is not good enough to be anything more than suggestive. You know. Which again is just something that these uh, umbrella analyses, the JAMA study authors, just arbitrarily decided, correct? Right. There's let's no say, precedent let's say for they, 99 they percent just, certainty. Right. I'm sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to talk over you, but let but let's say they they um, let's say they um, they're they're just just very rigorous people. You know, they just uh -huh. want everything, everything, whether they like it or not, to meet this very, very, very high standard. Sure. Well, uh, let's see. Let's see how they talk about the data when they. This is called. This is the section. There's. Let's see. There's. There's methodology. There's results. What's and then there is this large. So do section. they do That's they pick called, and choose uh, where they apply this newfound yeah. rigor? Is that yeah, what you're getting at for us? That, sorry. You're, is that what you're getting at for us that they they pick and choose where they apply this newfound uh, yes, uh, they affinity do. for they, rigor. Yeah, there's a section, usually formally when you write a paper, you, there's a section called discussion. You have the mm -hmm. materials, what, what you're doing, you know, the introduction, the materials and methods, and then you have the results, and then you have the discussion. Mm -hmm. Discussion is, is in, in this kind of paper, is where you go into the massage parlor, you see. <laughs> we're in the data massage parlor, and now, we're, now you can see, but it's amazing. They tell you what they did, but... In order to get media attention and general believability, because what clinician has the time to go reading a bunch of papers? Maybe they'll read the JAMA, the Lancet, you know, uh, British Medical Journal. They'll they'll read a few selected studies, and they won't read the studies. They'll read the first line and the last line of the abstract. They'll read the title. They'll glance at the authors, maybe. Mm -hmm. Well, so but maybe it's basically it's the byline. This is the JAMA. This is the gospel, as far as right. they're concerned. So here we have a very interesting 
they say um, they talk about uh, the, method, the means by which previous data that shows that estrogens uh, in you know, the birth control pills contribute to breast cancer risk, which they do. Current and recent use of estrogen containing hormonal contraception is thought to increase risk through a tumor promoter effect. Okay, so yeah, what about this? They have to deal with this issue. The previous studies have found it. So they say, well, in addition, any increased risk of breast cancer returns to baseline 10 years after cessation of combined oral contraception. Well, yeah, that's kind of small comfort. You know, what are you supposed to do for 10 years after you stop using birth control pills? Just, you know, sweat every day about whether you- Cross your fingers, I suppose. (laughs) Right, but even if that has some validity, is it true? Well, when they say that, they cite one study, not another umbrella analysis, not a meta-analysis, one study from the Lancet. Well, that's interesting because I seem to remember, and then I looked it up to make sure, that there is a, one of the biggest studies that they used in 2007 to say, oh, no, nothing to see here, oral contraceptives are safe, was a study based on the very long large cohort in England called the Royal College of General Practitioners study Uh cohort, Uh the RCGP study by uh, Philip Hannaford and co-authors. And they touted that all over the place as showing that contraception is safe, safe, safe. But when you look at that paper and you look at breast cancer and you look at breast cancer as a function of years since you stopped using oral contraceptives, well, if you're currently using them, no significant increased risk. If you're using them, you know, between five and 10 years after you stop using them, no significant increased risk. If you talk about 10 to 15 years, on the border of statistical significance, just about 95% certainty and a 27% increased risk. But when you look at 15 to 20 years, you've got a highly significant result, 145% increased risk of breast cancer between 15 and 20 years after you stop using them. So even one of the studies, they didn't cite it in this paper, but which this uh, cabal loves to cite uh, as a a proof that it's safe, when you look at one of their own previous papers, which had all kinds of problems with it, which was another outcome-based scientific study, but even if you look at the data there, it directly contradicts what they said about the effect being gone after 10 years based on one study that, oh, well, they'll, they'll pick this study because they want to prove wow. this point in this paper this way. And it's right. these days, everybody talks about following the science. What I hate to tell you is that the scientists are not following the science. And when it mm-hmm. comes to uh, issues that are politically s- sensitive, like abortion and contraception, especially when they, when they run up against a very, very um, important and widespread and largely very impactful medical risks like breast cancer, all bets are off. The science is actually, the scientific establishment is now uh, organized in order to prove certain outcomes. They concoct these umbrella studies, just they, they, for this, they're basically inventing a new methodology because the way they covered it up before wasn't good enough. So now they have to make something sound like it's better when it's really, uh, it, it's really far worse. It's, it's really uh, getting, it's really outcome based, quote, science. And that's right. And like you said, the, the, it misleads us from the title onward because right. they announce hormonal, con- that the study is about hormonal contraception. Um, and we've seen the, the way that I first found out about this study was from a headline in another uh, a health organization, Very Well Health, which is kind of a, beefed up version of, of WebMD or something like that, had picked up the headline popular on the study. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yes, a popular site and announced basically, you know, birth control mm-hmm. is safe, nothing to see here kind of thing. And that's where, you know, these studies, they, they have a very significant, uh, you know, impact on how people perceive what are very powerful drugs in, in, mm-hmm. in fact. Um, and you know, if you are a busy physician who just, you know, reads the title of the journal article, maybe you read the abstract, maybe you read the intro and the conclusion, 
then it's a very much uh, nothing to see here kind of message mm -hmm. that we're getting from this particular study. And it's only in digging into their methodology, as you folks have done for us, that we've found that they have moved the goalposts, they have invented a new methodology, essentially, as you said, Dr. Bryn. Um, and really, it sounds they've made it almost impossible with this 99% certainty that now all studies have to have. Oh, 99.9999. Right, there you go. Yes, 99.9999. <laughs> it's does that make it possible to ever um, find an association between anything ever? Course, Is anything if they, ever if they want to? Certain? If they mm -mm. want to, then that's then they will find it. Then all of a sudden, whatever evidence that worked on in their favor in this situation will not be cited in that situation, just like we saw with the Hannaford study. I mean, that was, a, that was a 2007 study that was, you know, one of the earlier efforts to show that contraception was safe, safe, safe. Right. And if they had actually used that in this study, it would directly contradict one of the main conclusions they had about the effects wearing off in 10 years. Right. So it's, it's just they will, they will, you know, they'll come up with new methods. I've never ceased to be amazed. Um, and I spent so much of my career actually debunking uh, bad science. As, as you know, my background was largely in abortion breast cancer uh, research. And, you know, of course, bordering on the contraceptive effects, you know, same disease outcome and sim similar mechanisms. <clears throat> and I, I, my, my study became really my scientific focus was not so much on the data on the connection but on the all of the efforts to cover it up and it was it was i suppose i i shouldn't admit that it was actually kind of fun to find out all of the you know oh, oh look what they did i mean it's like i used to I, I would print out the paper and give it a look through the abstract and then i'd leave it out on my desk you know, at room temperature for a, a, a few days or a week until it really started to stink, you know, and then I would. <laughs> so what you're saying is, is this is nothing new here, what they've done. This is part of a pattern of oh, yeah. systematically um, massaging the data, as you put it, to cover up what are significant associations between birth control use and adverse outcomes. And that is what our FDA petition was about. And I'd like to kick it over to Dr. Williams now to talk a bit more about our FDA petition and the methodology that you and the other authors used to find quite a few significant uh, relationships between the use of birth control and adverse outcomes for women. Well, thank you, Grace. I appreciate it. Yes, and I just want to give a little bit of background. I've been doing clinical research for several decades and in the course of that time, I've done quite a bit of uh, normal volunteer studies. And one of the things that you learn in clinical research is that it's absolutely critical when you're studying healthy, normal volunteers that you introduce minimal to no risk to these volunteers. Now, I think this is very analogous to the situation with hormonal contraception, where you're taking normal women and giving them potent steroid hormones. Uh, whether it be combined oral contraceptives or progestin-only contraceptives, these are potent steroid hormones. And so their safety profile has to be as clean as a whistle, in my mind, to, for it to be even ethical to prescribe them. Uh, Great point. Apart from any other issues or ethical or um, you know, moral issues that might be out there with contraception, just from a purely risk-benefit approach, uh, these are healthy people. And so right. this should really needs to be clean as a whistle. Right. So then the question becomes, as Dr. Brind uh, alluded to, what level of, of uh, evidence do you need to raise the alarm bells? And I think when you, you know, if, if you just think for yourself, uh, let's talk about some of the diseases that we found associations with breast yes. cancer, cervical, cervical cancer. Crohn's disease, which is an inflammatory bowel disease, which is chronic. It's a lifelong uh, battle for these patients that have it. Same with ulcerative colitis. Systemic lupus, my training is rheumatology. These patients have a lifelong 
a debilitating disease, which is often very, very life threatening, not to mention depression, uh, which of course is very, very prevalent in our society. And also- Especially with young people. Yeah. Yes. Especially among young people. Young people. Mm -hmm. And clearly augmented. And in fact, another recent study came out. Uh, and that leads to actually increase in suicide risk, which you know, right. we didn't cover in the meta-analysis, but you know, uh, now it's been known for a while that the progestin-only ones have caused osteoporosis, and they admit that in the prescribing information. Yes. But the evidence is now clear that it's not just getting your bones softer, but actually fractures, bone fractures yes. are increased. That's obviously a very severe uh, problem, especially for the elderly. And it can be, um, you know, it can put you in the uh, down ramp of life, basically, towards a very, very negative outcome. Not to mention the things that actually are acknowledged to some extent, like myocardial infarction and supervascular accident. In other words, heart attacks and strokes. That's acknowledged in the labeling. But it, what we found is that it's very misleading because we know that it's compounded by smoking status and age. And so the way they have the tables laid out in the prescribing information, it makes it look like the risk is from the smoking and from the age, and that the contraceptive just adds a little bit to it. That's a complete fabrication and massaging of the data to you know, reach a conclusion that um, is clearly not justified. And you know, when we put all these things together, and even subtracting out uh, disease, diseases that are decreased in prevalence, by the use of hormonal contraceptives like hyperthyroidism, uterine cancer, and ovarian cancer, you still end up with a million excess cases in the population of all these different diseases out there. So now you have to just stop and think for yourself as a healthy, you know, you, you know, obviously young woman because you, you know, they only used in the uh, age range of about 15 to 45, and the younger age is really problematic. But that's another issue. Um, but think about this, you know, what uh, kind of risk are you willing to take to um, set yourself up potentially for one of these diseases? Would a 50% increase in risk, you know, kind of put you off or 50% certainty rather that you would have an increased risk put you off from it or a 75% increase? Well, certainly 95% increased risk, I would think would you know, set the bells off in other healthy uh, individuals. But here they're saying, as Joel said, that it has to be 99.9% to even be weak evidence. And this is, to me, just um, beyond imagination. So, you know, we uh, did put our petition in. Uh, we're still waiting to hear from the FDA two years later to, to act on this. Uh, when they initially did respond to us, they said, you sent us a lot of data, give us time to review it. Obviously, they've been dealing with issues with COVID and a lot of emergency uh, authorizations. But at this point, I think it's time to really start to knock on their door very seriously and to say, when are you going to act on this? And of course, at the same time that we're bringing this to their attention, there's a huge move out there by the um, political elites to make these things over the counter. Right. And so it's um, it's a situation that to me just is, um, I don't know how to put it, it just takes my breath away to think about how our society is manipulating the health of women, putting it at risk just so that there can be a sterilization of intercourse. It just is. Amazing. And I, <clears throat> I think it's important to point out, too, for those who might not be completely familiar with our FDA petition, this is not a petition demanding that birth control be removed from the market. We've done nothing that extreme. We except have merely the MPA, asked, Depo. Except Depo, except yeah. Depo right. Well, I'll, I'll mention that in a minute, yeah. yeah. Right, but it's merely asking the FDA to do their job and look at the data surrounding adverse outcomes and hormonal contraception and update the prescribing information so that women and their doctors have the facts that they need to make these measured decisions for themselves. 
That right. is all we are asking with our petition. And the FDA right. has choose to continue ignoring it. Yeah. And, and you know, I should mention that um, many drugs have been pulled from the market with much weaker data than uh, yes. what's out there for, for some of these risks. And I do want to circle back to the DMPA, uh, Depo-Provera, basically. Uh, this has been shown to increase the risk uh, of transmission of HIV to women. And it appears to be unique just for Depo-Provera. Right. So if somebody is compelled to use hormonal contraceptives for some reason, definitely should not use that one because it has, in addition to the other risks, it has this additional unique risk to, you know, introduce HIV infection, which is obviously a very, very severe and preventable yes. thing. So, you know, that one we actually did say, look, there's all these other alternatives out there. Right be taken off the market altogether. So right. we'll see how the FDA responds to that, but we're still waiting for the meeting. And for anyone who's interested in, in looking at the petition and even commenting on it, which last I checked, I checked this morning, we have over 159 comments on the petition. It's on a publicly available government website. You can view it yourself. You can comment it on it yourself. Um, and it's, uh, we have links to it on the Natural Womanhood uh, website and articles about it condensing the information in it. And we encourage people to look into it and see, you know, this is nothing extreme that we're asking. We are, we are just asking for this information to more easily get into the hands of doctors and women so that they can be knowledgeable, knowledgeable about the decisions they're making, about what they put in their bodies. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, uh, it's, um, it's something that I, I think really needs to be brought to the forefront uh, and to, you know, actually really follow the science instead of manipulating it. You know, let's look at the data, but let's also look at the uh, ethical principles that are involved here. You know, let's look at what is an acceptable risk especially when now we know that uh, fertility awareness-based methods and natural family planning has such a good and in, in continuing to improve track record. Um, and so, you know, uh, there's, it's not like there's no alternatives out there. There clearly are alternatives that, that have multiple, not only do they, they avoid these negative consequences, but multiple positive consequences such as stronger marriages and better respect between spouses. So, you know, uh, this has to be uh, put into the minds of people. Right. And I think it's important, too, that um, whenever we talk about the risks of birth control, we get pushback from women who have been put on it because of painful periods, um, you know, oftentimes associated with things like endometriosis and uh, polycystic ovary sy syndrome, PCOS, and they're told that there's nothing better for them. And they do experience some relief on these hormonal birth control methods um, from, you know, these periods and, and, and pain that was very disruptive to their life. And we don't want to minimize what they were feeling before going on birth control. But what we take issue with at Natural Womanhood is them being told that that's their only option and that, in fact, is their best option. Um, and being told that birth control is in a way therapeutic for them, which we know that it's not, that it actually just gets rid of your menstrual cycle, essentially, so that you no longer have issues with your menstrual cycle. And so we, when we talk about how the data should be even stronger for birth control because it's not a therapeutic, that's what we mean, is it's not actually being used in women to cure anything. Um, and for a lot of women, it's just being used for pregnancy prevention. And there are better, safer options for both of those things, for menstrual cycle irregularities and for contraception that don't carry the risks that hormonal birth control does. And so when you're saying, you know, that, that it, just to be ethical, these drugs need to have no problems with them. It's because they're not therapeutic for anything, for any purpose. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Right. And so that, that was the impetus behind our FDA petition, which thank you, Dr. Williams, for digging into that a little bit more for us. Um, and I'd like to talk to Dr. Raviel a little bit now, again, because I think it's very important just to continue bringing what we're talking about today um, back to real world lived experience. And you were an OBGYN in the Atlanta area for over 30 years, and you saw um, what happens when women use these drugs um, just for whatever reason they're using them for. And I'd like you to talk now about what it is you saw in your practice that concerned you um, about the use of hormonal contraception in women. Well, thank you, Grace. And you know, I think the purpose of this study is really just to keep doctors in line them that it's okay to keep prescribing birth control pills for young women or older women um, and and to ignore what they're seeing actually in real life in their patients uh, for 17 years i did prescribe birth control pills and probably a third of an OBGYN's day and probably a lot of a family practice doctor's day and a pediatrician's day is taking complications from the pill adverse reactions to the pill wow. Uh, particularly more acne when they were put on the pill for acne, uh, abnormal bleeding when they were put on the pill for abnormal bleeding, uh, breast lumps, which cause great concern and require biopsies and mammograms and ultrasounds, um, depression, as Dr. Williams mentioned, headaches, severe headaches, but then sometimes you would see patients who had really severe reactions to the pill. I remember being called to the emergency room one night to see a patient who was not my patient. And um, she was in the emergency room with the GYN problem, but in eliciting her history, she had just been discharged from the hospital with a myocardial infarction, a heart attack. And she was 32 years old and she was on birth control pills. And I you need to get off the pill because this caused your heart attack. And she said, no, 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 the cardiologist told me it had nothing to do with the birth control pills. And you know, it's this, ty this type of study that it's in JAMA reassures the doctor, no, there aren't any side effects with the pill. So when you see a woman who actually has a problem, it's not from the pill, it's, it's something else, or it was just a fluke. I had an one day when I wasn't prescribing pills anymore with polycystic ovary syndrome. And this is a common reason that women go on the pills to quote, regulate their periods. Right. And I told her after working her up and finding that was a problem, I said, there are other ways that we can manage this. So I would recommend that we cycle you on progesterone, put you on metformin to control your blood sugars, go on a diet and lose some weight and all that. And um, she decided that she wanted to go on birth control pills. She came back a year later and she said, Dr. Raviel, you were right. And I said, why, what happened? And she said, I went on the pill, I got a blood clot in my leg and I threw a blood clot to my lungs. And I was in the hospital for weeks wow. and wow. had all kinds of long-term problems. So, you know, general doctors will see these types of adverse reactions. What many people do not realize is that almost 45% of women will discontinue use pills in a year. So they have a lot of adverse reactions that prompt them to stop the pill. And this JAMA study actually contradicts the World Health Organization, which had already declared in 2005, based on their research and studying all the studies on pills, that these drugs were group one carcinogens in the same category as asbestos. Uh, none of that really was publicized, though, in the mainstream media. When I stopped prescribing birth control pills almost 30 years ago, it was very interesting to see the change in your office because no longer did you have all the phone calls coming in every day with abnormal bleeding and breast lumps and breast tenderness. You know, patients were actually coming in with GYN problems that you could manage without using birth control pills. There are groups in this country that have trained doctors on how to manage patients without using birth control pills. Uh, Pope Paul VI Institute in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, Marquette University um, program for natural family also helps doctors manage patients without the pill. So we don't have to put patients even with medical on birth control pills, 
but certainly we should not be putting healthy, young teenagers, older women in their 40s, or any women on birth control pills as a means of contraception because of the significant risk of adverse reactions, both annoying reactions, but also risk of cancer, blood clots, heart attacks, uh, and all these other effects. Autoimmune diseases, which have mm -hmm. been on the rise for decades now, almost coinciding with the introduction yeah. of widespread use of hormonal contraception. Um, and again, you know, these are all things we've discussed in our FDA petition that the FDA has continued to ignore. Um, and unfortunately, these are all things that a lot of doctors who are not familiar with themselves because it's not in the prescribing information. Is that correct, mm -hmm. Dr. Raviel? I was not aware of autoimmune disorders until Dr. Williams brought that up. Personally, I had not seen that, but I was not even aware of that. It was mostly cancer, breast cancer risk, blood clots, heart attacks, strokes, liver tumors, which can be very significant. Um, so yes, that was very enlightening in the study when he showed that that was an effect of the pill. Right. Well, and you know, uh, there was there's something else that uh, Dr. Raviel uh, brought to mind about the uh, that patient who ended up having a pulmonary embolism, you know, deep vein thrombosis, all these deep vein blood clots. Now, when you look at the literature uh, before this so-called umbrella analysis came out, when you look at the literature, the data has always been considered quite convincing of the elevated risk for deep vein thrombosis. Yes. So what do they say in this paper? Oh, they have to address that, don't they? Everybody know, knows that it causes that. So here's what they say right in the abstract. In the results, they say, the risk of thromboembolism among them, those using versus not using oral contraceptive was an odds ratio of 2.42, which means 142% risk increase and definitely uh, statistically significant. Well, so what did they do? They say that was initially supported by highly suggestive evidence, not convincing, highly suggestive evidence but this evidence was downgraded to weak in the sensitivity analysis. See, they invent this <laughs> sensitivity analysis to take even things that everybody knows, everybody who's familiar with the risk profile of these drugs uh, knows about. And they say, oh, no, no, even that. When you, when you use the modern, you know, super duper epidemiological statistical methodology uh, to analyze it, you see... Nah, it's weak. It's really weak. 142% increased risk. Nah, does, doesn't mean anything, but it does mean, like so many patients, what Dr. Reviel was talking about. Right. Pulmonary thromboembolism, the strokes, you know, cerebral right. thromboembolism, you know, all of that stuff. Right. And that's what we need to rem rem remind ourselves and remember, is that when we're talking about percentage increased risks, it can seem very abstract, but that's how many more patients showing up in right. the ER with a pulmonary embolism. How many more women, we have stories on the Natural Womanhood website, you know, of young women who collapsed in their driveways. Um, yeah. You know, young healthy athletes who, uh, you know, are all of a sudden their lungs are riddled with blood clots and they can no longer, you know, walk, you know, from right. one end of their house to another, let alone compete at the level that they used to. And yeah. so, Practically speaking, you know, these are real women who are going to suffer these impacts. Um, they're not just a number. They're not just a percentage. And Dr. Raviel in her practice saw some of those women. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a very serious right. issue. And that was well documented and universally recognized in the literature. And they, they had to take that one out. That was, that was, mm -hmm. Speaking of gymnastics, that was quite a bit of uh, statistical gymnastics right there. Right. And, and while this study right now, it's a brand... I'm sorry, oh, I'm you sorry. continue, Dr. Rabio. No, Go what ahead. I was going to say is that uh, the all the studies on the thromboembolic phenomenon with birth control pills are not in the OBGYN literature. They're in the hematology literature. They're in the pulmonary literature. They're in the cardiology literature. So OBGYNs don't see wow. those studies. They're never quoted. And wow. uh, the ortho ever patch was shown to have an even higher risk of blood clots. And I remember the letter I got from ortho. I wasn't prescribing pills at the time, but they sent it to everybody. 
in the American College of OBGYN, showing you how you could explain to patients how they really didn't have to come off the patch, that this really wasn't a serious problem for them. So it was, again, manipulating the doctor to just continue prescribing it. And in 2014, Vanity wow. Fair had a big article on the Nuvering uh, contraceptive because of all yes. the women who were dying yeah. of pulmonary emboli from family members because some prominent women died and or were permanently disabled. And they came out and said, this should be taken off the market. But it has not been taken off the market. It's still being used. No. No. I would like to add something else, if I may, just uh, having to do Please. with the science, since I was trained as a bench scientist. I mean, I'm not a clinician. Uh, and these days also, the science is all about the data. And that's what clinicians see, the data. How many, this intervention was done or that drug was, was added. And, you know, you, you can see a change statistically in how many women or how many patients were affected positively, negatively, and so on. It's looking at the outcomes based on a drug. But I'm a scientist. My aim is always to find out exactly what's going on at the molecular level. It's not just statistical, mm -hmm. what's actually going on. And the fact is, we know what's going on. We know how, how these things cause blood clots. We know why the patch is worse than the pill. We know, we know exactly why uh, Depo increases the risk of uh, HIV transmission and why the other uh, contraceptives don't. So it's not even just a matter of battling statistics. Well, our statistical model is better than you. No, no, no. We, we actually do bench science with uh, cell culture situations and in vitro and animal studies and all of this. These, these uh, side effects, these devastating negative effects of these pills, and I, I don't even like to call them hormones because they're not really hormones. They're yeah. hormone agonist drugs. They're synthet synthetic drugs that act like hormones. Yeah. But uh, we know why, why they do what they do. And unless you, unless you have good evidence for why they do what they do, you can't even rely on just statistical evidence, no matter how strong it is. There has to be a, a reasonable justification. Dr. Lanfranchi has a very a favorite uh, analogy that she uses. She says, you can do an epidemiological study that shows very convincingly that carrying a book of matches in your pockets increases the risk of lung cancer. You see? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. Yes. That you could. Dr. Right. Williams, Only... <laughs> you look like you want to say something. What I just you... wanted to uh, emphasize that what Joel's saying, and I, you know, I also have done bench research, and I can tell you that um, the mechanism of action of these things for autoimmunity is also pretty well understood. Oh. So it's not just some of the publicized risks where we can understand the link, and obviously the link for osteoporosis and bone fractures. We really understand that uh, as well. So there's there's tremendous amount of uh, scientific uh, backup for this. But at the end of the day, it's the patient that counts. And you know, we had on our website some of these uh, testimonials. And I remember one man wrote in who lost his daughter because mm -hmm. of the use of the pill with uh, I think with mm -hmm. a large pulmonary embolism, if I remember correctly. And and other people wrote in with just horrific side effects that they've had and you know kathy's seen this uh firsthand and um it's just uh devastating mm -hmm. and dr williams i want to circle back to something that you mentioned earlier about the big push to make a lot of these drugs over the counter mm -hmm. and just this past month north carolina now you no longer need a prescription for hormonal birth control. You can go to your pharmacy, have a short talk with your pharmacist and get it over the counter now. And as you said, there's a push all over the country um, for this to happen. And so, and I see that we had a question from our audience about whether or not this study, this, this JAMA study will impact prescribing information. And the fact of the matter is that it could, right? This is a study that's been published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And when a study is published in such a prestigious journal, it does impact policymaking. It's what politicians use to push for making hormonal birth control over the counter. It, and it can impact what is goes into the prescribing information and what doctors know and will be comfortable with prescribing to their their patients, correct? It can, but only if the FDA applies a different standard of evidence to this 
than to every other thing that they have. Because if they use this standard of evidence, you would have to discount all of the side effects of every medication and all of the positive effects. So we're back to homeopathic medicine. We're back to, you know, herbal medicine to just, you know, I don't know what. But, you know, this standard of evidence is just so far out there that it would um, completely change the prescribing information for everything if they applied this across the board uniformly. So they would really have to say, we're making an exception because we think it is so important for there to be sterilized intercourse in our society that we're going to require 99.999% you know, level of evidence before we admit something is an issue. Mm -hmm. Great. The other yeah. thing is that having, having over-the-counter birth control pills uh, takes the woman away from an encounter with a physician practitioner or a PA and she's going to be at high risk for yeah. having other problems that won't be picked up specifically sexually transmitted diseases women often do not have any symptoms of chlamydia which is a very common sexually transmitted disease will lead to infertility uh, and so having these women get the pill over the counter maybe just with the blood pressure check and nothing else because birth control pills cause high blood pressure um, they're going to miss out on abnormal pap smears, STD testing, uh, and those other kind of well woman uh, visits that they would have if they were going to the doctor. Yeah, so that just, it kind of removes them from having what minimal stopgap safe, safeguards there would be in having an encounter with an OBGYN, who most would probably just help uh, prescribe the pill anyway. Some might do a little bit more due diligence with maybe taking a family history about um, clotting disorders and that sort of thing. You know, can we can we trust that women getting it at their pharmacy are going to have those same kinds of conversations that could be life saving? It's no. it's unclear. Why would you put the burden um, on the pharmacist? They're prescribing without being physicians. So um, that's it, it's just not about women's health. It's about selling more of the product. Yeah. yeah seem like that that is a driver behind it um and we've had a question about um what what women who have endometriosis can can do besides you know going on the pill and um that's you know kind of we kind of started to touch on that with pcos and that sort of thing about you know how often women are told that if you won't go on the pill, there's nothing else I can do for your endometriosis or your PCOS, your painful periods, your, your uterine fibroids. And um, Dr. Raviel, as an OBGYN who chose not to prescribe the pill after a few years of your, your practice, you know, what resources are there out there? You know, what can women look for if they don't want to go on the birth control pill to manage symptoms mm -hmm. of irregularity or, or pain with their cycles? Well, you know, endometriosis is a terrible problem for women, uh, severe, severe pain with their periods. Um, but, you know, you start out with various anti-inflammatories to treat that. There are some dietary things that actually do help reduce oxidative stress that leads to endometriosis. Um, but we have several very uh, capable, um, uh, minimally invasive surgeons around the country that can do a probably a prolonged laparoscopic procedure and uh, destroy all the areas of endometriosis and give the woman uh, relief of her pain and the possibility of having children uh, and all that. And uh, that is probably the best treatment. I will say that every once in a while you don't have a choice and for a certain number of months, the woman has to go on birth control pills to stop her period uh, to give her some relief from the pain. But the birth control pills do not treat the endometriosis. But there are alternatives, and with everything and so, else, like this, there are alternatives. Yeah, there are, are there are alternatives, and people can go on the website of a Napro Technology and find a doctor near them that would be able to manage them with alternatives to birth control pills. But right now, and, and when I was in practice uh, using birth control pills, you'd go home at the end of the day and think, did I really help anybody today? Everything the woman comes into the OBGYN's office for: headaches, acne, PMS, uh, depression infertility even, um, uh, and irregular cycles. Uh, besides contraception, the answer is birth control pills. That shows no imagination, no intellectual curiosity on the part of the doctor. 
but they've been indoctrinated to just use the pill to treat everything. Right. But fortunately, as you've mentioned, and, and you are an example of this yourself, Dr. Raviel, there are doctors out there who have shown a little bit more imagination and have have woken up and kind of wanted to offer more to their patients than hormonal birth control. Um, on Natural Womanhood, we have a list of doctors, doctors for NW, where you can actually find a doctor, hopefully in your area, who can, you know, get you the help that you need for your cycle issues without having to feel like birth control is your only option for treating what what you're going through. Um, and so that's that's what you know our work at Natural Womanhood is really about is is is. Uh, dis you know, um, dispelling the myth that women don't have other options because that's kind of the line over and over with birth control is, well, it's your only choice, you know, whether it's for preventing pregnancy or it's, you know, managing your cycle. And it's just simply not true anymore. And that's why, you know, doing these kinds of roundtable discussions where we debunk the, the bad data and also give women better information are, are so important. And where, why we have resources on the Natural Womanhood website for women to find doctors in their area to get the help that they need. Um, and I think uh, a, a point to make uh, in all of this is that birth control it's pretty clear from what each one of you have, have talked about in kind of the different parts of this discussion, birth control does not just affect um, a woman's fertility. It, it clearly affects a lot of different parts of her body. Um, it's not just preventing you from getting pregnant. You know, we've talked about autoimmune disorders. We've talked about breast cancer. We've talked about blood clots. We've talked about depression. We have hit every major bodily system that makes us makes us up is, is that correct you know i don't think we've we've missed out on anything yet and it's so it's not a targeted drug i think a lot of women think they take it and it just kind of does whatever it does just to keep them from getting pregnant but there are clearly effects across their bodies um, and that's what this jama study is is looking to to cover up and what our fda petition is looking to uncover so. Exactly, exactly right. I'm not sure about the earlobe. Maybe it doesn't affect the earlobe, <laughs> but pretty much everything. Touche, touche. <laughs> well, I'm going to take a quick look. Uh, if we have any questions um, from any of our listeners, we've got a few more minutes left in our webcast. Um, we can we can answer a couple of questions. Um, one I see here is, are there changes in the cervix to using hormonal contraception? Um, is, would one of you like to take that question on? Well, it does, it, the birth control pills yeah. increase, go ahead, Bill. They increase the risk of cervical cancer. Um, and that, and, and unfortunately today, the eligible BGYN is recommending fewer and fewer pap smears. So what I am worried about down the road, especially with the high birth control pill usage, um, is that we're going to, and the high incidence of STDs, including human papillomavirus, is that we're gonna really see an explosion of cervical cancer down the road. Uh, we don't know that the HPV vaccine really prevents <clears throat> cervical cancer. We haven't had it around long enough. Uh, I certainly had patients who developed dysplasia even though they had gotten the HPV vaccine. So um, the birth control pills. Wait, wait, wait. Vaccines aren't totally protective? Vaccines <laughs> don't work? Wait, what do you mean? I, I thought they worked fine. I... <laughs> they do for polio, Dr. Brin. <laughs> we should all have the vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's a, that's a big concern. And the World Health Organization found the same association. So to have an article in JAMA say, oh no, there's no increased risk of cancers with the, uh, with the um, birth control pills. You know, the birth control pills do appear to decrease the risk of ovarian cancer and endometrial cancer, but those are much less common cancers than breast right. cancer and cervical cancer. Um, and they occur in older mm -hmm. women. So we need to be concerned about the here and now about what's going on when a woman is taking the pill. Yeah, and I think it's important to point out, too, um, that uh, in the FDA petition, you all did not cherry pick the data. You were very clear 
in putting forth at all and, and, and did say, yes, there does seem to be some protective effects for ovarian cancer. Yes, there does seem to be some protective effects for um, one of the other cancers you mentioned, Dr. Raviel. Uh, that's what really strikes me reading through it is it's very balanced. You did not cherry pick data. You didn't invent new types of analyses. You used established scientific and epidemiological processes to find the associations that you did. Um, and that's why it's just, it's, it's, you know, a shame that the FDA does not seem to be paying any attention to it. Um, I have one final question from a listener in the audience, and then I'd like to kind of give you each an opportunity to give a, a final word on everything we've talked about. Um, final question, how does DEPO increase risks of HIV? And I think, Dr. Brin, that's your particular area. Yeah, uh, right. Uh, the, all of these, all of these, uh, yeah birth control pills, they're all steroid drugs. Uh, let's be honest about it, that's what they are. They're very potent. Um, and because they are drugs, they're not the actual natural steroid hormone. They have side effects because they act not only like the hormone you want it to act like, but also they act a little like other hormones. Well, it just so happens that medroxyprogesterone acetate, which is the depo form, is the long acting form of it. Um, also acts just like cortisol, you know, like hydrocortisone. Uh, we all know that hydrocortisone or drugs that act like that, like prednisone and so on, are immune suppressants. In fact, if you, if you have a transplant, you're going to be on a lifelong therapy that has high doses of these so-called corticosteroids. Well, Depo is also a corticosteroid. It's as, as good as it is a progestin. And it's an immune suppressant, therefore. And so experiments have even been done on laboratory animals, on rhesus monkeys, on, uh, you know, uh, cell culture and so on, to show the presence of more HIV, the, uh, the, the increased transmission of HIV. So it's not just, as I alluded to before, not just epidemiological data, but also experimental data that, that uh, has elucidated the mechanism, right, to the the chemistry of that particular steroid, and the other contraceptives are not also corticosteroid agonists. So uh, that's why it does that. And there's a lot of experimental evidence. And so uh, that's why we argued in our uh, petition that when you have, you know, in the Western industrialized world, certainly in the U.S. where the FDA has jurisdiction, uh, you have so many options for chemical contraception and only one of them, significantly by about 50%, increases the risk of uh, HIV transmission. Why on earth would you have that on the market? Who needs that? Mm -hmm. right. it's, it's absolutely um, uh, contraindicated by any reasonable standard. So and it's, it's, one wonders if it's suppressing your immune system to the point where you could potentially acquire HIV. You know, is your health really that great? when you're on it, if it's suppressing your immune system that much, right. what else is it keeping your body from being able to fight off? What other natural defenses are being dampened um, in a Very woman's body when she's on the birth control shot, which for those of you who don't know, Depo is known as um, Depo, Depo Provera, birth control shot. Those are kind of the colloquial names that are all used for it. Yeah, it's easy and it's cheap. It's easy to give to millions of women. They use it in rural areas like in Africa and other countries, and they're still promoting it. Right, so, uh, you know, it's killing, 1.7 it's killing million women. women on depot in the United States and 74 million in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for explaining that because I think that's one that really uh, people hear that and they say, that, that can't be right. That's, that's really serious. Mm -hmm. um, so just a final closing word from, from all of you. Maybe Dr. Williams, would you like to, to add anything to, in closing? Us. Well, I, I want to thank you, Grace, for having this. I think it's been um, a pleasure speaking and trying to shed some light on these issues that are so important to women. Um, and I really would love people to go to the uh, Natural Womanhood website and find out about the FDA petition. Uh, we are collecting signatures right now to yes. uh, uh, give a new impetus to the FDA to look at this. Um, and, you know, please lend your support uh, in any way that you can so that accurate information 
based on the real science gets out there to women so they can make informed choices. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, please go sign our petition. It is still active on our website. Um, there's a, a yellow button right up at the top on the homepage that says petition. We invite everyone who's listened to go and sign it, please. Um, Dr. Raviel, anything else to add before we sign off? Before I well, go to I Dr. Brent? <laughs> I would just reassure any women or any physicians who are on uh, this uh, webinar right now to, to if they're on the pill, to be not afraid and come off the pill. And I bet you will find that you feel so much better off hormonal contraception. There are all natural alternatives that won't cause you to get breast cancer, cervical cancer, blood clots, uh, autoimmune disorders. Uh, and, and for any physicians out there, there are several training programs that would help train them on how to manage women without being on yes. birth control pills. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's very important to point out. And Dr. Brent, any last yeah. words for us? I would just say, yeah, that this study, this JAMA study, we call it a study, actually exemplifies the complete turnaround, the complete perversion of the mm -hmm. science of epidemiology. It used to be mm -hmm. Back in the 60s, when, when, when that field was in its infancy, uh -huh. uh, it, it, was, it, tried, it was in support of the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle saying, if you find even one study that shows that there is significant harm from something, mm -hmm. then you should not market it. It should, be, mm -hmm. it should be unlawful. And that's become completely turned around in order to serve the agenda of those who, who want to make these, these dangerous drugs, um, who want to continue to have them available to as many people as possible. I mean, there have been, over the decades, there have been other drugs, which when, once they find that they increase the risk of various things, you know, thalidomide, the most infamous of, of them all, uh, they take them off the market for those purposes. Right. Um, uh, and uh, now, it, it, all, it all has to do with whether it fits a political agenda and a political narrative. So you, you just can't trust the experts anymore. You know, I mean, it's, it's just, and I think we're finding that out with COVID and this is just another, uh, another wake up call that, that the experts that we have been relying on uh, to provide medically uh, sound information uh, with which patients can be treated, uh, by which patients can be treated. It's, it's, it's just not true anymore. Very sad, but not reliable. Yeah, having a critical eye and, and weighing risks and benefits for oneself is very important. And um, women need information to be able to do that. And so that's why we have had this round table here today. Um, I thank you so much, all three of you, for participating in this with us, Dr. Williams, Dr. Brin, Dr. Raviel. Um, thank you for working you know, tirelessly to get the right information into the hands of women so that they can make decisions for themselves. Um, you know, thank you, everyone who's, who's listening, everyone who's sent in questions. Um, you know, this, this program was made possible by the generosity of individual donors to Natural Womanhood, who in fact make all of the work we do at Natural Womanhood possible. Um, if you'd like to watch this program again, share it with others, we will have a link to this recording in our weekend e-newsletter. Um, I mentioned earlier on the homepage of our website, there's a yellow button for the petition. There's also a yellow button for our newsletter. So. I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. We send one newsletter every weekend with all of our new um, material that we're putting out, and we hope to continue doing more um, multimedia type content like this. Um, and in order to do that, we we need your help for us to be able to continue holding our our healthcare to healthcare institutions accountable, um, making sure women receive what really could be life saving information. Um, we need your help. We need you to donate if you can. We need you to spread our word, um, sign up for our newsletter, sign our petition. There's so many ways that you can help further the work of natural womanhood and getting this information into the hands of girls and women everywhere. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us today and everyone have a wonderful weekend. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Grace.